morning, everyone. Please turn to Matthew chapter 4, from verse 1 through 11. Look at the Word of God today in Matthew chapter 4, from verse 1 through 11. All right, Matthew chapter 4, from verse 1, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into this desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdom, the world, and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. We title today's message, The Temptation of Jesus. So we'll get the temptation of Jesus. So we are reading today about Jesus' temptation prior to beginning ministry. And there's a lot that we can learn from this. Uh, The reason why is because in faith, we will inevitably be tempted by sin. So it's important to read the scriptures and know how to respond. And we have to think as well, too, how will we be prepared for temptation? Of course, just like anything in life, it's uh, not good just to react, right? It's like something happens and then you react. This is not... this is not preparation. You know, preparation is not just reacting. Uh, so, you know, you might think today's message is like a formula. Uh, you get tempted, and then you do this, right? You know, you, this happens, and so you react like that. But, uh, you know, it's not exactly uh, this kind of message. Because in life, it's not that easy. The life of faith is not that easy. And, you know, what I really want to see from today's message is something more than just reaction. Uh, How preparation, you know, how we can prepare for it. And when we look at how Jesus deals with temptation and Jesus, how he responds to this temptation, you can see something more than just a reaction here. What you can see in today's message is a worldview in how you approach, approach sin, approach the life of faith. And that's what you can really see from Jesus' uh, how Jesus uh, reacts to that temptation. You can see that there's something in Jesus, there's a worldview in which uh, we can learn about how to approach temptation. And so uh, that's what's most important today uh, a biblical worldview, you know, a biblical worldview of how to approach sin and how to approach temptation. And how can we gain a worldview? You know, it's not going to happen in one message. Obviously, it's not like I delivered this message to you today and then everything is good, you know, about sin. It's, it's not going to be like that either. You know, how we gain a worldview, of course, is by daily studying the Bible, by praying and studying the Word. As we do that, this is how we gain a worldview. But still, I hope that today's message can help us a lot, that, uh, you know, through today's message, we can learn about temptation, about sin, and how to how to have that worldview, uh, because, you know, we need this. You know, Satan, uh, from Satan's perspective, the devil always wants us to fall into temptation. But, you know, we need to look at it from God's perspective. God allows us a way to deal with that temptation. He allows us a way to be stronger, and God always allows us a way to rise above that temptation. And so, you know, we need to look from that perspective today. So I hope we can gain that today in faith. And as we study these three temptations one by one, uh, we can gain this kind of strength and this kind of worldview in faith. So let's look at the first one. 
This is from verse 1 through 4. This is the first temptation from verse 1 through 4. And Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So, Jesus uh, went out to the wilderness, allowed himself to be tempted. And at this point in time, uh, when the devil came to him, he had already been fasting for 40 days. He had already been fasting for 40 days out in the wilderness. So the first temptation that the Lord faces is that if you are the Son of God, the temptation comes Turn these stones into bread. That's the first one, right? If you're the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. In the life of faith, this is what we have to know. It is this temptation that is the first and most obvious challenge that we will continually, continually face. What is this temptation? It's a temptation of bread. It's a temptation of material things. It's a temptation of tangible things. It's the temptations of things we can see visibly. It's a temptation of things we can, you know, grasp, you know, right in front of us. You know, this is this kind of temptation. And what I'm trying to say here is, wouldn't it be easy if we followed Jesus and he provided everything that we could need? All the material comforts, all the visible things that you think right in front of you could satisfy you. And wouldn't it be easy if Jesus provided all of that? Here's the thing. In life, in life, we're going to have rocks in front of us. You know, there's like rocks, like hard things. You know, hard things you have to overcome. Rocks that are in front of us, like stones. You know, this is what it's talking about here, right? Rocks, stones. There's going to be stones, hard things in front of us, hard things to overcome challenges that we will all uniquely face. And it's different for everybody. It's not that everyone's, you know, rock. It's not that everyone's stone in front of you is the same. There's going to be challenges that we are all uniquely going to face. And for different people, it's, it's different. For some people, it's, it, I mean, it's like food. You know, it's money. It's material things. But for others, it's other kinds of things. It's like a job. Or maybe if you're a student, it's like the, the studies, the tests that are in front of you, in front of us. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that there are hard things that are in front of us. There are visible things that we think are important, are necessary, and we have to overcome them. And so these visible things are like challenging rocks in front of us. Now, wouldn't it be great if those stones suddenly turn into bread? You know, the, the rocks in front of us, the hard things in front of us were suddenly, just all of a sudden, solved just at once. The stones turned into the bread that we need. You know, people, they really believe like this in faith. They pray to God. They say, you know, if God just gives me what I need, then everything in life would be perfect. They think like this. You know, the, the, that, that if... If, if this stone and that stone and this stone, like all these stones that are in front of you, you know, the tempter comes, if you're t- the son of God, tell these stones to be, tell these stones to become bread. You know, when you really think about it, how vividly real is this? Like the, the, the stones, and, and, and it's not that the situation is easy either. You know, Jesus had been fasting for 40 days at this point. So think about it. It's like the situation where you've been suffering and suffering and suffering by these hard, visible things in your life for so long, whether it be material things, whether it be your studies and your tests, or whether it be you know, some job you're trying to find, or something like this, this. These hard stones, these challenges that you have in front of you in faith, in your life, suddenly... We could say that these stones turn into the bread. The exact thing that you needed, it suddenly turned into that. And people, they believe like this. They believe and they pray, you know, God, just solve this thing, these stones that are in front of me. 
and everything in life would be perfect. All, all, all and everything I need would be perfect. Those visible things, if God, you can just solve those visible things I need, then everything would be perfect. But here's the truth. You know, mankind is not so simplistic. You know, we're not just animals that need like these physical, visible things that we have in front of us resolved. It's not that if I just have all these visible stones in front of me solved, that everything's, everything in life is going to be perfect. It's, it's, it's really not like this. You know, there's a, a famous sculpture by Auguste Rodin called The Thinker. You know, maybe you've <laughs> seen it, right? The Thinker. It, what it depicts, what they say it depicts is Dante pondering the gates of hell before writing his uh, Divina Commedia. And so, you know, he is depicting Dante pondering the gates of hell. And this is what the artist Rodin had to say about that. He says, art is contemplation. It is the pleasure of the mind which searches into nature and which there divines the spirit of which nature herself is animated. You know, I think artists, they know better than anyone how complex uh, man is, mankind is. You know, the spirit, the uh, mysteriousness of mankind, that's much different than animals. You would never depict an animal, <laughs> you know, being a thinker, right? And, you know, there's something in us. There's something in us that is more, more than just, like, visible rocks, it's like we think like that. We think it's so easy, right? You've got these visible rocks in front of you and they're resolved and they turn into bread and then everything is, is good. But it's not so simple. You know, life is not so simple. We're not so simple. It's not that I just solve these things that I can see in my life and then everything is going to be good. We can turn as many rocks as we can think of. All the rocks. All those rocks you're visibly thinking of in life... Turn them all into bread, and you, you can turn them all into bread, and you think it'll solve, but you, you think it'll solve everything, but it won't. No, it won't. It's not going to solve the essential things that are inside of us. And this is what Jesus is trying to say here. If you look in verse 4, right, in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. What Jesus is saying is that what we're Lacking is God. We're lacking God's nourishment. We're lacking God's word. We're lacking something much more deeper than the visible things that are in front of us. You know, the word of God in the spirit. It's true. Man's biggest problem is not material deprivation. It's not that we're deprived of the visible things in front of us, but it's a spiritual bankruptcy. We have a spiritual bankruptcy inside of us. This is very clear as you study more and more into the Bible. This is the worldview that the Bible gives us. We have a, a deep spiritual bankruptcy inside of us. If you look at Amos chapter 8 and verse 11, Amos chapter 8 and verse 11, the prophet Amos in the Old Testament, he says, The days are coming, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine for hearing the words of the Lord. So, you know, it's not a, it's really, it's not a famine for, for visible things. It's not a famine for food or a thirst for water. But, you know, it's a, it's a famine for the word of God. It's a famine for the spiritual bankruptcy inside of us. We live in a, in a country with so many things. You know, all the visible things you need, you have it. You know, in fact, you know, this country, this country, any visible thing that you think you need in life, the opportunity is there. It's all there. We have so many things. We have so much food. We have so much money. We have so much materials. We have so much abundance. It's all, it's all there. But then still, you know, in this country with all those visible things seemingly solved, why is there so much suicide? Why is there so much depression? Why are there mass shootings? Why are so many people overdosing on opioids and dying? Why, why, is, why, do, all these, you know, why, why do all these things occur? The answer is, is that there's still a spiritual bankruptcy 
inside of us. That even with all those visible things that are seemingly can be resolved, we still have a spiritual bankruptcy inside of us. And there are so many lost people. And all these lost people, these lost people, we're not, when we're lost, it's not that we're, we're missing rocks and bread. That's not the problem. It's not that we're missing stones and, and we, need the bre- we need the stones turned into bread, but what we're missing is a key missing relationship with God. That's what we're missing. We're missing a relationship with God. And that's what we really need. Inside of our spirits, we really need God and we're missing. We have a spiritual bankruptcy inside of us. And that's what we really need. You know, these days I was telling my brother James here, I started following him and doing intermittent fasting. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, it's, uh, you do, what you do is you do like, uh, uh, you know, 18, 20 hour intermittent fasting. It was hard at first, you know, uh, doing this. But, you know, what happens is, uh, you know, at first, like you do it for the first week and, you know, not eating for the whole day and just eating one meal at the end of the day. It's, 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 it's hard to do because, you know, you feel hungry at lunchtime, at, 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 at dinner time or whatnot. But, you know, you suddenly get used to it. And you realize, you know, you realize something. You realize, you get used to it, and you, you're, not, you're no longer hungry at those meal times. And then you realize you really don't need to satisfy your hunger all the time. You know, this is, this is what you realize. It's like, it's okay. Like, I'm hungry, and I don't need to, like, satisfy that hunger, like, immediately. You know, I'll still live. It's okay. You know, I'll still live. And, you know, the daily bread's going to come a little bit later in the day, but the daily bread's still going to come, and I'll still live. And... And you realize, I don't need to take that time to necessarily satisfy my hunger. There's more important things to do. And that's what really what happened. I realized I have more time in my day because I don't need to figure out what I need to do for this particular meal. You know, and, and you, you realize this. You realize we're so focused on this. You know, when, when you do this, you realize we're so focused on satisfying rocks into bread all the time. You know, we do this all the time. We're always always constantly trying to satisfy rocks into bread. But then we become so far away from God when we do this. How do we fight this temptation? Jesus exhorts us. You know, it's not just a a reaction to this. It's not that, you know, suddenly I'm looking at visible things and I, you know, the temptation of rocks into bread and I just do it at once. It's it's not just a reaction to this temptation. He exhorts us. This is... What Jesus is, this verse here really is an exhortation to change your worldview. Don't live life. Don't live the life of turning rocks into bread. That's what it really is. It's not just like, don't turn the rocks into bread. He's like, don't live the life, right, of turning rocks into bread. That doesn't solve our problem. We have spiritual needs. We have spiritual needs that can only be resolved by being nourished by the Word of God. And we need that. We need the Word of God. We need that relationship with God. And really, this is what Jesus is exhorting us here. And I hope we can really see that today. Okay, so let's look at the second temptation. This is from verse 5 through 7. This is from verse 5 through 7. Uh, Matthew chapter 4 from verse 5, it says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. So this is what this temptation is. When the devil can't break us by the obvious things, when he can't break us by the visible things, he turns to this temptation. And what this temptation is talking about is, is something a little bit deeper. It's, it's talking more about the, the mental will inside of us. It's talking about something in the mind about our, our will, what, we, what, our, what our mind wants and what the mind's will is. So let me explain this. The devil says, throw yourself off the high point and God will save you. Right? Throw yourself off the highest point and God will save you. It's a, a, a test saying, God will go according to your will, basically. This is what this, this temptation, this is, it's a little hard. I know it's a little hard. You read this and it's, it, it, you know, <laughs> what is this temptation? It's hard to explain and understand, but you know, I'm going to I'm gonna try to explain this for you. It's a test basically saying, 
God will do things according to your way and your will. You know, how often actually do we do this? God, I'm going to have faith in you. I'm going to believe in you if you do this or you help solve my problem. But, you know, this is the wrong world of you in faith. You know, we don't come to God to gain something. We don't come to God to grant our wishes. It's not like God is some sort of genie that, you know, we, you know, we, 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 we go to God, we pray, and then God suddenly grants our wishes. What I'm trying to say, in essence, is, is that it's not a contractual relationship. You know, our relationship with God is not a contractual relationship to believe. It's not that we come to God and then we believe in Him and then we do and we do the good things in faith and then God, you know, does, 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 does the things that we, we want in faith and the things that we think in faith. You know, it's not a contractual relationship with God. We come to God for who God is. Our relationship with God is one of love, is one of love, right? That's our relationship with God. It's not a contractual relationship. It's a relationship of love with Him. But oftentimes, we want faith controlled in my way. We want things the way that we want them, not how they are. So, in extreme cases, what, what happens is, is we can systematize God, faith, and life. And we think, you know, we can operate life, faith, and God in, in, in an operational system that, that we think matches and, and fits, right? But... You know, God is not for us to judge. Now, God is the ultimate judge. God is absolute. God is eternal. God is way above us. God is the truth. This is what the Bible teaches us. So, when we judge God, we snatch justice away from Him. It's like we're becoming the God of God. But this is a, a faulty way of thinking of faith. You know, snatching God who is justice, God who is absolute, we snatch justice away from Him. And, you know, this is a, a very faulty thing. And what this is essentially saying is, you know, that's what we're doing here. This is what this temptation is. We're testing God. We're testing God in a way in which, you know, we think that God should operate in, in a system of justice and a system of absoluteness that we think. You know, we become the subject, God becomes the object. You know, this is what this is trying to say here. You know, we snatch justice from God. God, who is the judge, we snatch justice from Him. But this is a faulty way of thinking about faith. Where we're often tempted like this in faith is God telling us, do not do, like prohibition. This is where this temptation often comes in. God tells us, do not do something, but we still want things our way, right? We still want faith in, in a way that we can, you know, by, by our will, by our mental will, we want faith the things that we want, um, we, we want things. Now, God told Adam and Eve, do not. This is prohibition, right? God told Adam and Eve, do not eat, but they still ate. Because their pride wanted that control. Right? They wanted it within, you know, their pride, you know, that's what it is, the knowledge of good and evil. They want, they want the control of what good and evil is. And so God told Adam and Eve, do not, because God is the absolute judge of what good and evil is. But we want, we want that control. We want that control of what we think right or wrong is. We don't want God to, to limit us. And tell us, do not, do not do something. And so, you know, that's the, the difficulty for so many in faith. They want things, we want things the way we want them. We want things how, how, how we want them. And, and we think faith should go, go my way. You know, do not put the Lord your God to the test. You know, this is trying to say, God is the absolute judge, not us. But we try to become the judge. We try to decide what is, you know, what is good and what is bad. And, and, and especially in prohibition, we do this. Things that in faith God tells us not to do, we still want to do them, even in that way. Uh, let's look at Luke chapter 21 and verse 34. 
Luke chapter 21 and verse 34. Luke chapter 21 and verse 34. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxiety of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. So, and I hear there's, Jesus is carefully warning us about, you know, but I think two, in fact, two clear addictions that our hearts get weighed down by. First, do not drink alcohol. It's, Drunkenness, right? Do, uh, you know, do not drink. Not only drunkenness is bad, but you know, we need to know that you know it's a gateway to to many other sins. In high school and college, you know, this is how temptation starts. It's how, you know, you you see this in in in, in schools. You know, there's alcohol, there's smoking, and you know, it starts with sort of these things, but it opens the door to to so many so many other things. You think. You know, I'm not like that. I'm not going to fall into temptation. Even if I do do it, then I can still control myself and my faith and, and, and everything will still be good. You know, my faith, my way. This is what I'm trying to say about prohibition. You know, this is what happens. This is what really this temptation is. You know, my faith, my way. But, you know, under the influence, we lose control. You know, this is what these things do. You know, drugs affect the body, the mind, and the spirit. And so, you know, do not, you know, this way of do not is wisdom. You know, the second thing here is, is dissipation. You know, wasting away. You know, that's what this, this temptation is talking, this, this, this sin is talking about, the, the, the wasting away of, of things. You know, how do, how do we dissipate entertainment, gambling, video games in this era as well also? You know, when I first came to church, you know, there was this, this first-person shooter game that I was addicted to. I played hours and hours and hours, and I didn't sleep. I'd go all night, sometimes like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., really. There was, <laughs> this is when I first came to church. Before I came to church, this was something like this. And I knew it wasn't right. Like, I had to do other things. I had to study. You know, and then, you know, reading the Bible that says, you know, and, and, and don't be lazy and don't dissipate like this, so... You know, and so, you know, I, I tried my best, you know, and I, I stopped. I did stop. I got busy with other things, and then I stopped playing. But, you know, later on, what happened, this was even a little bit after, you know, I started going to church. You know, there came summer break and a little bit of extra time. And so I started, started playing a little bit again. Oh, you get, this is what addiction happens. You get overcome with addiction, and... You know, it took a while, like on and off, but it's something I still remember. You need to, you know, young people, you need to really work on this addiction. Young people easily, easily get addicted. And you rationalize. It's only for a short period of time. You know, I'll just, just do it just to relax and to rest a little bit. But quickly, you know, quickly it turns into dissipation. And this temptation, this temptation is very, very hard. This is, this is what I'm talking about. This is what this temptation is. I know it's a... A very difficult, you know, the way that it's, it's put it here in the Bible is very difficult to understand what this temptation is, but that's what it is. You know, we rationalize. We want faith or way. And we try to test God. We try to test Him in our way. Like, you know, if I can have faith my way. But in faith, we need to believe it's not my way or my will, but it's God's way and God's will. And do not, do not do prohibition. These things that in the Bible, when it tells us do not do, this is wisdom, right? This is wisdom in faith. The Bible is telling us wisdom in faith. You know, we so like rationalize other ways and other things. And that's that temptation. That's that temptation that we want to systematize it. We want God to, we want faith to be, to be my way. But then I become the judge of God. God is the judge, but I become the judge of God. That's what we do when we, when we, when we, when we put faith in my way. And so, you know, believing in God who is absolute, believing in God who is the judge, God who is the ultimate judge, God who is the truth. You know, this is what the cross is. Jesus walked the path of the cross completely and obediently, sacrificing himself and surrendering his will. You know, Jesus had all the power. 
Yet Christ was obedient on the cross, even amidst the... He was tempted on the cross, but he avoided it. And we so quickly fall away. We so quickly lose faith when things don't go our way. When we think things aren't the way that we think things should be. Right? We think faith and the Bible and and what it says. You know, I'm not sure if I can really, really do it that way. I'm going to do it my way. And I'm going to... I'm gonna, uh, you know, you know, I'm gonna think how things should be my own way. We co- quickly fall away from faith if things don't go our way or things don't go how we think it should be. But Jesus, if he didn't surrender to God's absolute will, then there would not have been Calvary. There would not have been redemption for all of us. And if there was no redemption then here today we would be lacking what we, needed mo- what we need most, and that is salvation. We need salvation. We need salvation from the sinful world that's full of temptation, full of sin, full of addiction, full of slavery, slavery to sin, slavery to the power of death. To follow in the path of Jesus is to carry the cross with him. It's to surrender our will to God's absoluteness. That's what, this, this, that's what Jesus is trying to say here in, in, in avoiding. This is the world view which Jesus is giving us in order to avoid this temptation. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 7. Jesus answered, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Right? That's what it's saying. It's saying that we, it, it, it's, it's not for us to stand above God and to test Him. We are not the judge of God. God is the judge. So that's the worldview that Jesus is giving us here. To avoid temptation is by being absolute, believing in the absolute God. Do not test God. Have faith in God's absolute will like that. He is the truth. Believe in God's will absolutely. And I hope we can be these ones. Finally, let's look at this last temptation. And from verse uh, 8 through 11 from verse 8 through 11. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. So the devil again brought him up to the high place And he said, I will give you anything and everything that you can imagine. So, you know, here's how it is. Uh, The devil, when he cannot break us by the visible things, when he cannot break us by the visible things, when he cannot break us by our will, like our mental will, like we're even able to go overcome that, then this is the last temptation that comes. And what is this temptation? This is the temptation of our dreams of our imagination, of the vision of our life, right? This is what this temptation is, and I'll explain. So, you know, think about your life. What is the above and beyond that you can think of in your life? What is your life vision? What is the dream that you have that you want to accomplish and that you want to do in the world? What Satan does is he comes right after that. He comes to that. He tempts us exactly in that. What he says is, I can give you that. You know, the above and beyond, to the high place of the temple, all the splendor, the dreams, the imagination, the vision that you have, I can give you that if you just follow me. If you just follow me and follow my ways, I'll give you that. Now this temptation, I tell you, is very, very scary how real it is. It's so scary because, you know, rationally, it makes every, every bit of sense in the world. You know, I think personally, among all the temptation, this is the one that, you know, scares me the most personally. Because, you know, since I was very young, I had this. Like, I see things for myself in my life. Like, my dreams in the world. And they're very important to me. Now, how I see my life and how I see, you know, my place in the world, my, my, my biggest vision and dreams for myself, you know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, this is, this is very important to me. 
And so, you know, I, you know, really, I find this to be the scariest of them all. Because what will happen is, is, at some point in your life, you will find an opportunity. It will come to you in the side of this world. You will find the opportunity that maybe, just maybe, that great vision and, 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 and that dream I had in my life, you know, the world will come and say, Maybe I can go and fulfill, maybe I'm going to give you that opportunity. The world will come and say, I'll, I'll give you that opportunity to fulfill that dream. And what Satan tempts us is, don't follow, the, don't follow God. Don't follow God, but follow, follow the world. Because God can't fulfill that big vision and dream that I had for me, for myself in my life. And rather follow the world because, you know, I want to do it my way. You know, I'm going to follow the world and I'm going to, to fulfill that, that dream. That there's this opportunity that comes and I'm going to follow and I'm going to fulfill that, that dream I had for myself and I'm going to do it my way. And I'm going to do it my way. But here's what we have to know about this. Uh, do you know who the loneliest people in the world are? You know, who are the loneliest people in the world? I think the loneliest people in the world are People who have exhausted everything that they can dream of. You know, like everything. All, the, all that they can hope for and dream of, it's completely fulfilled. I think these are the loneliest people in the world. You know, there are people actually like this. There are people who accomplished the absolute heights of everything that you can imagine in the world. That, that their, their, their dream for their life inside of this world, they accomplished already the absolute heights of all that they can imagine. But here's the thing. Once you reach it, once you reach the, the height of everything that you can imagine in the world, that, that biggest dream that you had, they're still not happy. There's something missing. And there's this inexplicable loneliness right, that they have. I mean, they can have it all, but there's this inexplicable loneliness, this deep, this deep thing inside of us, that, that's, that's, you know, it, it, almost, it, it almost boggles the imagination. Like you would think that someone who fulfills everything in the world, that everything would be great for them in life, but it's not true. It's not true. Really, there's this inexplicable loneliness. Do you know what was one of the, the most shocking things I ever saw from a person who was at the top? I mean, he was at the very top of fulfillment. You know what was one of the most shocking things I ever saw? Michael Jordan won six championships. The best to ever play. The best sports athlete ever, in my book, actually. You know, when I look back at his career, he was the best. Loved watching him play. When I was young, there was a black and white TV that we had. Downstairs, my, we had the big TV that my dad always used. And, and upstairs, they had this black and white TV with the antenna. It only got one channel. But on that channel, we got to see the NBA Finals on that channel. So my brother, turning the sound low to like one volume, like looking really close at that. That's probably the reason why I have glasses. Is because, you know, I'd be, looking, I, I'd be looking at this. And game five. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Those who know sports know game five, the sick game. And all that, he was so sick, but willing, willing his team to a championship, he was, oh, he was the greatest, greatest basketball player ever. But, so, you know, greatest basketball player ever. After he retired, he was immediately elected to the Hall of Fame. And I was there watching his Hall of Fame speech. Oh, the most jaw-dropping speech you would ever see. He speaks for 30 minutes, and do you know what he does? This is the person who's achieved everything you can ever think of basketball. Do you know what he does for 30 minutes? He rips and mocks everybody who ever challenged him or ever doubted him. He just, like, completely, like, rips them. He's got this, like, like <laughs> there's, like, this inexplicable bitterness inside of him about this. And so, you know, most people, they play it off. They say, this is... You know, this was just his competitive fire that was in him. But, you know, it made me think about this. It made me think, you know, why? Why does this person at the very top have this inside of him? You know, this, this like, inexplicable bitterness in him. You know, even the person who's accomplished everything he has, that kind of bitterness, it's, oh, it's like there's this, this unsatisfied feeling. You know, it's, it's like it's, it's lonely at the top. 
It's very lonely. It's very lonely at the top. You know, your greatest dream and imagination, I tell you, even if you have it, the greatest dream and imagination you have in the world, I tell you, even if you have it, there's still this emptiness and there's still this loneliness. Jesus says we must not fall into, them ta- into this temptation. He says in verse 10, Jesus said, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, written, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. We must not fall into tempta- this temptation and we must worship God and serve Him only. Worship God and serve Him only. It's true. The only way to resolve the loneliness and emptiness inside of us is when we have God's amazing love. We must worship Him. It's, it's when we have His amazing love that that loneliness could be fulfilled. And what is the dream and vision that we must have? It's not the dream and vision inside of the world, but the only dream and vision that we have that is actually meaningful, that is actually real, is the eternal vision and dream for God's kingdom. To serve God only. When we serve God and embrace His, His dream. You know, when we talk about this worldview of this temptation that Jesus is exhorting for us, that's what it is. It's worshiping God because He, God is the one who loves us and He, a relationship with Him is, He resolves that loneliness, that emptiness that we have inside of us. And serving Him, it's the dream that we must have is not the dream of the world, but is the dream of God and His kingdom. That all the dreams in the world that we can have can't even compare to the kingdom of God and the great commission that Jesus gave us. In faith, Jesus called called us to avoid this temptation by embracing this, by having, by worshiping God, having a loving relationship with Him, and serving God's dream only. That's why we have to constantly read the Bible, pray, serve God's kingdom. It's one soul lost and helping save that one soul. It's that when we follow through and we serve God and we're serving God through His great commission through saving souls, when we're serving God, then we can avoid this kind of temptation. When we follow God's dream in my, in, for my life and submitting to his, his vision, this is when we can avoid it. Worshiping God only and serving Him, submitting to God and, and everything. You know, this is... Now, this is the worldview that Jesus is teaching us here in, 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 today's, in today's message. Submitting to God when it comes to visible, material things. Submitting to God when it comes to our mental will, the things that we think should happen, our, our mental will. Submitting to God when it comes to our dreams, imagination, and vision. It's submitting to God. It's giving up all of that you know, for God, for, for the kingdom. Like Jesus, we will be stuck in the wilderness, in hardships. But, you know, to live for God's kingdom, to save one more soul, this is something so precious. And something, does, something precious happens to the one who does this. The one who does submit to, to God's will, the one who, 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 does, who does follow, who does serve God and follows His kingdom, something precious happens to that person. The Christian writer Margaret Manning said, Yet, for those who seek to follow Jesus, the journey will always take us through the wilderness. And she's talking about the temptations here in the desert. Uh, The journey will always take us through the wilderness. We cannot escape it, nor can we go around it. We're always going to face that wilderness. We cannot escape it. We cannot go around it. But perhaps, by the God of the wilderness, we can indeed be transformed by it. As we're overcoming this temptation, as we embrace the worldview that Jesus gives us, we can be transformed by it. When we serve God, transform ourselves, when we're transformed by God, I should say, and when other people that we're helping being transformed in their life through Jesus Christ, you know, we're no longer the sinful, lonely, anxious people of the past, but we are a new and beautiful creation in God. Ravi Zacharias said, For those who surrender their intellect, their will, and their imagination, there is no more beautiful expression of the worship of God. I hope that through today's message, we can change our worldview completely to complete submission to God. 
when we are tempted by visible things, by our will, by our dreams and imagination, just like Jesus was, you know, we can embrace what the Lord taught us, to live for the most, more essential spiritual things, to have absolute faith in God, not by our own will and faith, but by God's will, and to surrender completely to God's vision and His kingdom. And in the end, it's all for God's kingdom. It's all for saving souls. I hope we can be the ones to remember that and be transformed in faith. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we thank you, Lord, as we uh, really reflect on these, this path in the wilderness that you took in the desert uh, to be tempted. Uh, we reflect on our life of faith in the wilderness of this world. And Lord, we wish to embrace a worldview that you taught us uh, today, this biblical worldview, Lord. For Lord, we come to see that there are stones, there are rocks, there are visible things in front of us, and the temptation that, you know, faith would be easy if all those can turn into bread and they would be resolved. But Lord, we come to see that, more importantly, we shouldn't just work for one by one trying to resolve those stones into bread, Lord, but, you know, we should embrace something more essential, your, your word, Lord. Uh, we should embrace the spiritual things. And Lord, uh, when it comes to uh, us, Lord, we try to test you. We try to be the judge of you, Lord, who's actually the absolute judge. Uh, but Lord, we wish to submit to your will, not by our will, but by your will, Lord. We wish to submit to that. And Lord, uh, or dreams or visions, Lord, uh, we come to see that the opportunity in the world will, may come one day for us to try to fulfill it in that way. Uh, but Lord, we wish not to fall into that temptations in the world, but Lord, know that even if we did, Lord, we would still be lonely. And the loneliness can only be resolved with a relationship with you, Lord. That's what we're inexplicably missing is that loving relationship with you. And we wish instead, Lord, to serve you and your dream of the kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us that, uh, guiding us in our path of faith. And Lord, we wish to embrace, uh, Lord, that your, your, uh, your love in our life in that way. In Jesus Christ's name I pray.